Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today's uh, discussion uh, is around uh, ESOPs and ESOP as a strategy for succession for privately held companies. And we have a panel discussion here with a couple of our uh, key clients that have gone through ESOP related uh, transactions in the last couple of years and um, have successfully navigated uh, the beginnings of succession for them and, and, and their family groups. And so um, just a little bit about WealthPoint, everyone in the room for the most part knows us, but uh, we're a firm that has been around for going on our 11th year and have worked with over 150 family groups, uh, partnership groups, uh, regarding the succession of really their most valued asset, which is their operating companies. And uh, we have built a firm around that and uh, helped them navigate succession at five levels. Uh, who's going to be the next owners and shareholders of, of the company, uh, who are going to be the next leaders and managers in the business as, as succession within the workforce takes place, excuse me. Um, and uh, as far as uh, that goes, you know, those are two different things typically. So leaders and, and managers aren't necessarily the same people. So we are very mindful about that in the succession process, as well as the relationships in the business, um, both uh, internally in the company with employees, uh, other family members potentially, uh, and also with uh, clients, customers, and uh, you know key vendors, suppliers. Who owns those relationships, and how do those successfully transition on to the next generation as well? And then finally, the fifth area of focus is really around the culture of the companies, because um, the companies we tend to work with, uh, first of all, to get to the point where you can execute on a great succession plan, uh, you have to be a successful business, right? And so in order to create that success, they all have a certain culture that has allowed them to do that. And, and so we want to be sure that that culture and that mindset gets passed along, whether it's a generational transfer within a family, whether it's an ESOP where the employees, you know, eventually wind up owning the business or even during a third party sale, because uh, as a lot of you know in the room, when companies go to third party sale, a lot of times the culture from the old company doesn't transition through and, and then there's a lot of disconnection and sometimes even failure of the business if it's not done properly. So that's our core focus. We create a significant better outcome for our clients. Sorry. <laughs> We've got microphones all over the room, but there's Are one right Italian? here where I'm sitting. <laughs> um, but, uh, Ultimately, that's what we do. We create a significantly better outcome for our clients uh, than they would have had had they not met us uh, related to the succession and transition of, again, their most valued asset. Um, I want to introduce uh, quickly the partners at WealthPoint uh, that are here. Tim Young in the back there is our managing partner. Uh, Mike Olson is a partner uh, in our business on the insurance side. Uh, John Chiampio is a partner of business advisory services. Uh, and so is Jeff Mayhall. Jeff, where are you at? You're right in front of me. There's Jeff. <laughs> Jeff is also a partner uh, here at WealthPoint. And uh, Joe Liggett and uh, Peter Maturko are partners there up in Denver and they're on the Zoom uh, right now. I'd also like to introduce them. And uh, I want to introduce our, our, our clients that are here that are going to be on our panel discussion as well. So uh, Dan Puente and Danielle Puente with DP Electric. And then Chris Malham, Chris back in the back there, is... Uh, uh, one of the founders at Cycleworks, which is a, uh, the largest uh, uh, commercial uh, landscape company in Arizona. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Michael Kenneth, who you guys all know and, and uh, been, worked with us in the past. And Michael's our director of solutions. And uh, been with the firm going on over 10 years now and, and uh, has an expertise in, in uh you know, really putting together the, the solutions and, and his team behind the scenes for us regarding all of the, the inner working components financially and structurally in terms of, of the decisions that our clients make. And, and so Michael heads up that team in our business. So I'm going to hand it over to Michael and he's going to start the presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks, Frank. Um, a couple of just housekeeping logistical things. Uh, both for everybody here as well as everybody that's attending online. Uh, we're just going to go through a quick overview presentation on ESOPs, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the strategy itself uh, for operating businesses, uh, hit on a few key points, uh, and then get into our panelist discussion. 
Um, we'll have some time at the end for questions, um, either for myself or for anybody at the partner at the Wealth Point, as well as any of the panelists. Um, anybody that's attending online, if you do have questions, please use the chat feature. Um, we have a, one of our colleagues, Ari, is kind of monitoring that. So if there are questions that come up, uh, he'll let me know and we'll go through those as well. Uh, in addition, if anybody wants CE credit, uh, make sure to send an email to Caroline. I uh, probably received confirmation from her or, or emails in the past, but uh, Caroline will point that out. Obviously, include your name, uh, what type of CE you want, CFP or CPA, uh, and then the license number as well. We'll make sure that we get you those certificates. So, uh, so let's just jump right into ESOPs. Um, what I really want to cover today is, is more so of an ESOP 101. Um, I think that there's a lot of information about ESOPs. ESOPs are complex, um, but they're also very much a unique and elegant success planning strategy. So uh, ESOPs in general, employee stock ownership plans, uh, they really are designed to create a method to monetize a company's owner's interest uh, while maintaining control, or at least having the possibility to maintain control. We'll get into that in just a second. Uh, and also providing, obviously, an economic benefit to the employees. Uh, from an employee perspective, the stock in the ESOP is actually uh, owned in an employee stock ownership trust, and all of the employees become beneficiaries of that trust. Uh, the stock then is allocated to those employees over time. Uh, there's a few different methodologies to allocate those shares. Uh, typically, it's based on compensation. And so a real simple example, the more you earn, the more shares that you're going to be allocated over time. Uh, there's also a few different factors that you can put in there, maybe base it off of tenor, so how long people have been there or have a service-based uh, component as well, um, but it gets a little tricky. There's a lot of technical aspects of that. We can dive into that if anybody wants to, but uh, there's a lot of tax provisions and tax code regulations that we want to be mindful of as we start to allocate those shares if we uh, do something out of the ordinary um, as opposed to just based on compensation. There are certain limits to that. Um, ESOPs are designed to benefit all employees of the company. And so there are limits in terms of compensation and what you could be allocated. Uh, that number adjusts for inflation every year, but it's right now it's about 280 or $290,000. So if you have a high income earner, something on the executive team or a high earner salesperson, their income is actually capped at that 280 or $290,000 number uh, for purposes of allocating shares uh, to them in the ESOP. Uh, from the employee perspective, they then are going to be allocated these shares each and every year that they work in the business. Over time, those shares are going to be worth whatever it is that the company is going to be worth and their ownership of that. And then they'll have the ability to monetize those shares at their various triggering events. Um, obviously, retirement being one of them, death, disability, uh, termination as well. Um, but at that time, they're able to monetize those shares, they actually sell the shares back to the ESOP. Uh, and then those payments are typically made over a five-year time period. Uh, and from a company perspective, if they have more cash flow or they have a lot of cash available, they can actually make those payments earlier than that or sooner than that. They can accelerate that payment time for the employees. But generally speaking, it's a five-year payoff. So a very simple example, if somebody retires and has a $500,000 plan balance, they're going to get a check for hundred grand a year for the next five years. Uh, all full-time employees must participate in the plan, so they're non-discriminatory. You can't say I only want directors to participate or front office staff or the sales team or whatever it is. Um, all full-time employees participate, uh, but you can also figure out some creative incentive compensation ways and maybe some synthetic equity, which we'll get to in, in just a few minutes, uh, to provide additional value or additional economic value to key leaders, right, management, uh, those types of people through, you know, phantom stock plans, stock appreciation, right, something like that. Uh, the big thing for <laughs> is that they operate very similarly to a 401k plan. So in a 401k, you put, put, put money in, uh, it's tax deferred growth, and it's taxable when it comes out. And so um, they operate very similarly to that. The main difference, though, is that in an ESOP, the only asset of the ESOP is the company's shares. In a 401k, you can choose all of your investments, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, whatever it may be. Uh, but in an ESOP, it, the only value or the only asset, I should say, of the actual plan uh, is the company. There is some diversification provisions, uh, meaning that after a certain amount of time of being in the ESOP, individuals or participants can roll over into a 401k plan or roll over into uh, other tax deferred vehicles. Uh, but we're really focusing on when the company uh, is in the ESOP, uh, you know, from the transaction prior to about 10 years of, of an existing ESOP. 
so one of the things we want to cover today is just who are the players. So there's a lot of uh, service professionals that are involved in ESOP, specifically on the initial transaction, which we'll hear uh, a little bit more about from our panelists today, but as well as on an ongoing basis. And so you obviously have the company and the shareholders. Uh, when you look at the transaction or selling of shares to the ESOP, uh, not all shareholders have to participate equally. And so, if you, for example, if you have a, a partnership business, multiple partners are involved <laughs> with different ownership, if you sell shares to the ESOP, not everybody has to be on that train ride of selling those shares. You could have somebody sell 50% of their shares, somebody else sell 75%. It's very much an individual one-on-one uh, -on -one transaction between the ESOP and that exiting shareholder. Uh, you also have a trustee. Uh, that trustee has a fiduciary responsibility to do what's in the best interest of the employees. They represent the uh, employee stock ownership trust, and they're typically hired by the company to do that, to serve in that purpose. Uh, from a trustee perspective, it doesn't have to be somebody that's independent. Uh, you can have somebody at the company serve in that role or something like that. However, we highly encourage that you have an independent trustee at a minimum for the transaction. Right? It needs to be an arm's length transaction, and what we want to do is to set that up, set that up with an independent trustee, somebody that's a third party to the business, so they're representing the buyer in that uh, initial transaction. Uh, from our perspective, we actually think having an independent trustee is the way to go for uh, you know, the, the entire duration of an ESOP. It's just a better protection, not to mention trustees are, are designed to have a fiduciary responsibility to do what's in the best interest of the, uh, the employees. <clears throat> There's also legal counsel times two. Uh, so in an initial transaction, you're gonna have legal, legal counsel that represents the trustee and really the buying side of that transaction, as well as on the company side or the, the existing shareholders. And so you'll have legal counsel that represent the arm's length transaction between buyer and seller. You have a valuation firm as well. Uh, that valuation firm is gonna perform an independent third party valuation. They actually do it every year. That's how you come up with the value of the business to determine what's the share price that then is allocated to all of the employees. They also come up with the initial valuation, which the trustee uses as their basis for negotiations. So um, we'll get to some of the misnomers in a second, but there is a valuation that gets done every single year on an ESOP business. Uh, there's also a third party administrator or a TPA. Uh, it's basically just the outsourced firm to help manage all of the compliance aspects of an ESOP. Those are the companies that will create the participant statements. They'll help with compliance testing, um, help with you know, tax filing, accounting questions, those types of things. Uh, there's also a facilitator, a consultant, uh, an investment banker, however you want to word it. Um, but it's basically the individual or the firm that helps to structure the transaction. Um, you know, stress testing the financial model, financial models, pushing the process forward, holding all of the accountable parties accountable uh, throughout that entire process. And then lastly, the commercial banker. So if there's bank financing, we'll get to that in just a second of where that plays a role. But if there's bank financing, obviously you wanna have that relationship with the commercial banker to provide that bank financing, uh, whether it's you know, at the initial transaction or maybe subsequent purchases thereafter. Uh, so we're just gonna go through a quick example of kind of how it works. And this is more so on the initial transaction side. Uh, there's really four key players, if you will, that are on the initial transaction. Uh, you have a bank, assuming there's bank financing. You have the company, uh, Arizona Distribution Inc., highly successful business here in Phoenix. Um, you have the ESOP, and then you have the, the shareholders. And so step one is that really the company is going to go and borrow money from a bank. Uh, they're the, the company is the asset that's really generating all the cash flows. It's going to be the one that's responsible for paying back that bank debt. And so it's going to go out and borrow money from a bank. Hopefully, or ideally, from a, a shareholder perspective, it's not recourse. Uh, but as everybody knows, it really depends on the facts and circumstances with the overall business. So, you know, how much could you borrow? Where does the um, you know leverage become unaffordable or violating debt covenants? Um, and is it going to be recourse or not recourse basis? Uh, step two is that the company then is going to make a loan to the ESOP. Uh, the reason why we do that is because we want the ESOP to have the money to purchase the shares. Right? We don't want to go through a redemption and have the company buy the shares. We want to have the ESOP have the cash flow uh, to fund that uh, purchase, which then turns into step three. Uh, so at that time, the ESOP basically pays that cash uh, to the shareholders in exchange for their equity. Right? It can be any percentage of equity. We'll talk about that in just a second. but. Um, they're the ones that are buying the shares and the shareholders are selling them. 
Uh, in some situations, you might have a, a, a seller carryback note as well. Maybe you can't obtain enough bank financing to fund the overall transaction, um, or maybe it just makes a little bit more financial sense to have you know, bank financing as well as a, ser a seller carryback portion. Uh, if that's the case, then that seller note is actually going to be assumed by the corporation. And so now the corporation is going to be making those payments to that uh, shareholder from a seller carryback perspective. One of the advantages of that is just the, the cost of that, right? So the exiting shareholder might be able to take some chips off the table from the bank financing, and then maybe we'll offer more favorable terms to the company, maybe a longer duration, a lower interest rate, um, you know, or uh, interest only period, something like that, in order to make it an affordable transaction for the overall business. Uh, this slide here uh, is just some common ESOP inaccuracy. So if you Google ESOPs, oftentimes what you come up with are very negative uh, results, right? ESOPs will destroy your business. ESOPs will uh, you know, too over lever. They don't work, all of those types of things. And so what we went through is just listed out some of the kind of common misnomers or inaccuracies, if you will, about ESOPs and then provide some comments on them. So one of the statements that we, we often hear is that when you sell to an ESOP, you must sell for less than fair market value, right? I'm selling to the employees, so I should take a discount. And that's just false. We went through it earlier, but there's a third party valuation that gets done uh, to substantiate the, the purchase price. It's also an arm's length transaction. Uh, we'll hear from our panelists in just a second, but you go through a, a, an LOI process, you go through a purchase price negotiation uh, in order to get the best value, right? In any transaction, uh, it always has to be willing buyer and willing seller. And I think anytime you have a willing buyer, a willing seller, then you've arrived at whatever the fair market value is for that operating business. Uh, one of the statements they also hear is that the trustee takes over control of the business. Right? I sell to an ESOP, ESOP trustee now gets to make all decisions and everything has to go through that person. And that's false as well. Uh, the trustee's only role is to represent the ESOP. They have kind of a fiduciary responsibility to do what's in their uh, best interest of the employees or the participants of that ESOP. And most quality trustees have absolutely nothing to do and don't want to have anything to do with the operating business. Um, we actually had a situation with a client recently. Uh, they went through an ESOP transaction. We just did a rollout with them. And this was one of the, question, the questions that came up is, uh, Mr. James, as trustee, are you going to be responsible for making decisions? And he said, absolutely not. I don't want that level of responsibility. I know nothing about running an operating business. We'll hear it from our panelists today, but um, you know, one of them is an electrical contracting company, one, one's a landscape developer, and the trustee for both of them have absolutely nothing to do with running the operating business. They also don't know how. Uh, if they did, that's what their role would have been, right? They would have been a business owner running those businesses, not serving as a trustee. Uh, next one, all employees must weigh in on every decision, right? So if I sell to the employees, now I have to share financials with them. Now I have to ask you know, permission to do things because they're the owners of the business. And that's also false. Uh, the employees have a beneficial ownership in a trust, which owns the business, which is governed by a trustee. But ownership doesn't mean that they have control, right? The operating, the operation of the business, decision-making, governance, all of those types of things still remain with the current people that are involved in all of those decisions. Uh, I must sell 100% of my, ES or my ownership to the ESOP. That's false as well. Uh, an owner can sell any amount of shares to an ESOP. I will say that there's a level of uh, a threshold, if you will, where if you don't sell enough shares to the ESOP, it probably just doesn't make financial sense, right? If I'm gonna to try to sell 5% of my shares or something like that, but I have to incur costs in order to go through the transaction, it might not make financial sense to do that. Um, but you can sell anywhere, uh, you know, any percentage of, of shares to the ESOP. Uh, we'll hear today, uh, one of them, one of our, our panelists sold 30%, the other one sold 100%. We'll kind of talk a little bit about the differences between that. Um, I'm going to skip over the next one. The employees, you know, never have enough cash to buy me out. They're not buying you out. The ESOP is, and the ESOP is funded out of the future cash flows of the business, right? Um, employees are not, you know, taking a, pal a salary cut or, you know, siphoning off some money in order to make this transaction happen. Uh, it's always funded out of the future cash flows of the business. Uh, compliance fees make the ESOP unaffordable. That's false as well. Um, we, you know, anytime you're looking at an ESOP transaction, you should run through an analysis to see whether the tax savings of the ESOP and the intangible benefits of providing ownership to employees and, and getting those uh, you know, tangible benefits of the tax savings, if they outweigh the compliance fees. 
they almost always do. If they don't, why would you go through the transaction, right? Why would I incur that cost uh, if there's not a, a substantial benefit? And the last one that we actually feel very true about uh, is the ESOPs are a viable succession, plan, succession planning strategy for the right business. That's absolutely true. Depending on the company, its objectives, uh, the industry, the financing, the terms of the purchase, uh, ESOPs can absolutely be a viable strategy uh, for an exiting business owner. Uh, so we'll touch on a little bit of the income tax benefits as well. Um, I think everybody here, whether in person or online, probably wishes that they paid less income tax, generally speaking. Um, and so from a, a structure perspective, there's substantial tax benefits that come along with uh, you know, being an ESOP uh, business. First, an ESOP is a tax exempt entity. And so income that flows through from the corporation to that ESOP uh, is going to be uh, resulting in zero taxes that are being paid. If it's an S corporation, right? You have an income that flows through on the K-1, ESOP doesn't report any taxes, so there's no taxes that are paid. Uh, which basically means that we're using the government's money to either pay back debt or reinvest in the future growth. Um, you know, from the financing perspective, an ESOP is actually a way to make debt payments on a more sort of pre-tax basis as opposed to an after-tax basis, right? So if I have a company that does a million dollars a year of earnings, for example, do I want to put 400000 to the government or would I rather put 400000 to paying off debt, reinvesting in the business, or just generally having more cash to weather the storm should there be any financial or you know, economic hiccups in the future. Uh, in addition, ESOP contributions are tax deductible. Uh, there's a limitation there up to 25% of eligible payroll. Um, what that basically means though is that I can make a contribution to an ESOP just like a profit sharing plan or a 401k match or something like that, but get a tax deduction for that as well. Um, and then again, those funds can be used to pay off that note between the ESOP and the company, again, on a pre-tax basis. Uh, there's also uh, 1042. So if anybody Googles ESOP, I almost guarantee that 1042 is going to come up at one of the top uh, top hits. Um, and 1042 is basically a rollover tax strategy uh, where you're, as a selling shareholder, able to defer or eliminate, um, in some situations, capital gains that are due upon the sale. It's very similar to a 1031 exchange for real estate, if anybody's been through that, or a 1035 exchange for life insurance. But basically, a shareholder will sell their shares to an ESOP, and then they have to roll those proceeds into what's called qualified replacement property, uh, basically stocks, bonds of U.S. operating businesses. And when you reinvest those proceeds, you're just deferring the gain, right? So you're just rolling over the cost basis and rolling over the value uh, of the transaction into those qualified replacement property. Whenever you monetize those shares, right, whether it's you know stocks, bonds, like I mentioned, of, of U.S. companies, at that point is when you would recognize taxes that were owed originally on the ESOP transaction. So it's very attractive. Uh, there are some constraints associated with it. One, the company must be a C-Corp at the time of sale. So that presents its own limitations there. Um, in addition, you have to make sure you have the cash to be able to make those investments into qualified replacement property. Right? If I sell my shares for $10 million and then I invest 10 million into stocks and bonds, I don't actually have any cash then to enjoy my lifestyle or to go do things that I want to do. Uh, there's some strategies to get around that as well. You know, you can take a margin loan or something like that to kind of generate some more cash for you. But it's definitely something that's, you know, worth a look. But at the same time, it also has to make sure that it works for the exiting shareholder as well as the business, right? We put more pressure on the business by doing a, a 1042 transaction uh, versus not. A uh, couple more slides just real quick, and then we'll get to our panelist discussion. Um, this one here is just on board governance and control. So as I mentioned earlier, but the business operations and governance remain the same pre and post ESOP, right? Currently companies that are looking at being an ESOP, they make decisions, they have a board, albeit sometimes maybe it's more of an informal board, uh, depending on the, you know, uh, the company, but they still make decisions from that perspective. You still have a board of directors, you still have officers in the business. Post transaction to an ESOP, it's the same thing. You still have a board of directors, those individuals still make decisions for the business. Um, the big thing here is that the ESOP trustee is, is just a shareholder, right? They're representing the trust as a shareholder and they're not involved in the day to day management. Uh, the board of directors also is something that's determined prior to the transaction. 
Um, so the existing board is the one that gets to determine who's on that future board. Um, in some situations, the trustee might ask that there's an independent director that be added to the board, somebody that maybe keep the, the current board honest. Um, it's also done from an optics perspective as well. Uh, but as you add that independent board member, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that today with some of the panelists, but um, you know, from our perspective, that can actually be a value add. Right? Maybe you can bring on somebody that's got expertise in the industry, um, operations, finance, sales, whatever it might be, uh, just somebody to help add value to the overall business. Um, in addition, the board has the ability to replace any SOC trustee. Um, there's certain protocol to go through, voting situations, those types of things, but if it's deemed prudent, you can actually switch trustees or change trustees if, if, if desired. I mentioned earlier, but there's also some incentives for key people that can be factored in as a part of the <laughs> ESOP transaction. Um, a transaction could include some sort of an equity plan for key employees or management. Um, you know, might represent X percentage of the company's you know value, maybe three percent, five percent, ten percent, something like that. Um, the typical structure involves some sort of synthetic equity stock appreciation rights. Um, you know, maybe some fan of stock, something like that. But it's just really a methodology to maybe incentivize some of those key leaders, as opposed to just saying, you're just going to get your ESOP shares. The more you earn, the more shares you get. Um, in these types of plans, you can structure it so that you can have, you know, customized vesting rights, uh, customized, you know, timing of when, you know, valuation will be realized, what those payouts are going to look like. Um, you know, the SARS package or the stock appreciation rights is something, though, that must be negotiated as part of the overall transaction uh, because it, you know, has a, a dilutive effect, right, to the ESOP. The ESOP, if I buy 100% of the business, but 5% is going to, you know, synthetic equity, I'm really buying 95% of the value, not 100%. So it's just something that we want to be aware of. Uh, alternatively, you can have employees uh, that can also receive real equity. Um, actually, you know, BP Electric was one of them where, they looked at it and said, we want to have real equity for some of our key leaders, as opposed to some sort of synthetic or, um, you know, phantom equity, if you will. Uh, and then the last slide that I wanted to touch on, and we'll invite our panelists up, is just uh, the timing. So, you know, one of the things we work, as Frank mentioned, we work with a lot of business owners that are looking at ways to monetize or a succession planning strategy. Uh, and one of the things that we've constantly heard is when you look at a third party sale, there's a level of uncertainty there. Right? Am I going to get the value that I want? Who's going to buy the business from me? I have to go through the auction process. And I have to go through, you know, deciding on, you know, the LOI and the due diligence, negotiations, and you know, it can be there's a level of of exhaustion or uh, you know deal fatigue, if you will, that can take place in a third party sale transaction. In an ESOP, it's much more of a defined process. Right? You're creating your own buyer in the sense of you're creating an ESOP. You want to reward your key people. Uh, and there's really a defined process to help with that transaction. So we listed up just here, um, you know, kind of the activity or different phases, if you will, and then the timing associated with it. Um, you know, most ESOPs can close somewhere in six to seven months. Some situations it might be faster than that. If there's no bank financing or, you know, less complexity. In other situations, it could be longer than that. Um, but it's really a much more defined process, to kind of have a, an ability to know who, all, who are all the players, who is the buyer and what are the steps associated with it in order to, you know, eventually get to the time where you're closing the transaction, monetizing your business and, and receiving that economic value. Uh, I will say that when you've been through one ESOP, you've only ever been through one ESOP. Um, ESOPs are unique. They're complex. Uh, every company is different. The industry, the financing terms, the structure of the transaction. And so, you know, every situation is different. But I think that this gives a pretty good picture of just, you know, who are all the, the players, as I mentioned earlier, kind of what's their timing and when they're involved. Uh, keep in mind, this is just for the initial transaction. On a subsequent basis, right, you're going to go through evaluation every year. You're going to go through, um, you know, the participant statements and those types of compliance, do more testing, um, that kind of thing. But from initial transaction, uh, you know, it's really a six to seven month time frame. Uh, so I want to uh, actually go ahead and stop there. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if not, we'll actually invite our panelists up and go through a little bit of a Q&A. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to interrogate any of you guys, so uh, don't, be, don't be scared about it. But um, yeah, if you guys want to come up, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions or are there anybody online? 
Uh, again, if you do have questions, feel free to use the chat feature uh, online. Yeah. <laughs> if the business is growing rapidly, um, at what place does the, at what point does the valuation take place? Sure. Like, can that be anywhere or is it typically a or? Soft um, projectors. Yeah, so the question was, in case everybody, um, not sure if everybody can hear it, but um, the question was, if the business is growing rapidly, you got a lot of fast growth or, or a high growth company. When does the valuation take place? And so, you know, in an initial transaction, uh, the valuation obviously takes place during that due diligence phase, right? The trustee um, and the, the selling shareholders are going to have a, uh, a letter of intent, right? They're going to make an offer to purchase the shares. Um, and then you're going to go through that kind of due diligence process. And that time is when the valuation takes place. That initial valuation is only ever shared with the trustee. Right, it's not shared with the company. It's not shared with the, the selling shareholders um, because of the fact that that creates a little bit of a conflict of interest. Right, if I know what your valuation is, then I bet my purchase price is going to be at least that or higher. Um, on an ongoing basis, the valuation occurs once a year. Right, so most of the plans that that are implemented, you know, it's based on a calendar year for for the plan itself. Um, so the valuation typically takes place, uh, I would say, you know, March or April, if it's a December 31st uh, year end, they have to see the financials, right, close the books, file the tax return, and then do the valuation. At that point, then you have the participants' uh, statements that come out and are shared with everybody. Uh, another good point on that, actually, Mark said, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, from an employee participant perspective, if anything happens during that year, right, if I get terminated, if I retire, a death, uh, you know, disability, whatever it might be, uh, if that's the case, then uh, what happens is that the valuation is as of the prior valuation, right? So if I have, you know, valuation happens for the prior year in March, you know, when somebody passes away, we're going to use the valuation for the prior year to determine you know, what's the value of their shares. Uh, so it's updated on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, any other questions? Uh, you get one. Yeah. Go ahead. So theoretically, with this question, the valuation would factor in the future growth. Right? Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. From a valuation perspective, uh, I'm not sure if everybody's seen valuations before, but uh, from a valuation perspective, uh, you're going to factor in, you know, prior performance, right? Analyze it, but then also factor in future performance, right? There's going to be a management interview where you see the company going. Uh, from that perspective, what are the you know prevalent multiples in the industry? Um, those types of things. So, yep. Uh, we did have one question uh, online as well. Uh, was you know can the shareholder slash the owner be the trustee? Uh, and then if the owner is the trustee, are there any legal issues that he can face in the near future? Um, my answer is that no. I, if I'm the shareholder and owner, I, one I wouldn't want to be the trustee. Uh, as an exiting business owner, I think that they already have a tremendous amount of risk, um, illiquidity risk, all of those types of things, maybe their personal guarantee of debt, who knows, um, but that shareholder owner should not be the trustee. Let's go out and hire somebody else to serve in that fiduciary capacity. Um, in addition to that, you know, I think from a, an owner perspective, you know, the owner knows how to run the business, but the owner does not know how to be a trustee, right, have that fiduciary level of responsibility of those types of things. Yeah, right. You guys can actually, um, you guys want to move the chairs over? You can sit right in front of the screen. That'd be great. What are some situations that where an ESOP would be like the best choice uh, to transition out of the business? That's a great question. Um, I can give my feedback, but I'd actually love to hear that from the panelists as well. Um, from my perspective, there's a couple things that you you need to have happen to make it into a candidate. One, uh, a profitable business. Right? We need cash flow, whether it's to fund debt, whether it's to fund you know, the employee repurchase liability. You know, a volatile cash flow business presents some challenges because what happens if something happens, we're in a down market, those types of things. Um, I also think you need to have an owner that wants to reward all employees, right? Um, you know, meaning that they're invested in the employee's future. Um, from that perspective, uh, as opposed to, you know, um, trying to get as much money out as they can, and I want to over lever the business, and that's somebody else's problem, right? Um, the other difference, too, I think, is that 
in an ESOP transaction, most of the time, it's very difficult to get 100% of your proceeds out in cash day one, right? Especially if you're selling 100% of the business. We have, I see a lot of bankers in here. I'm sure there's a lot of bankers online. Most of the time, you don't loan to value 100%. Um, we all wish that you guys did, but I don't think that anybody's willing to do that. So you, from that perspective, you know, third-party sale, you might be able to get out 90 plus percent of your proceeds in cash up front. In an ESOP, if you sell 100%, you know, you might not be able to get out as much cash up front. Still can be more favorable terms, higher interest rate on the seller note, those types of things. Um, but you need somebody where they're not necessarily interested in getting out, you know, 100% of their cash day one up front. Sorry. Yeah. Michael, is there a rule of thumb in terms of business size, whether that's size of revenues or uh, employee base that maybe an ESOP does it make sense? Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a fair question. I think, um, you know, from our perspective, I think, you know, a million dollars of EBITDA and above, I would say is a pretty good rule of thumb. I think if you have a company that's less than that, it might become economically unfeasible, right? For the compliance fees, for the initial transaction fees, those types of things. Also, I think the lower the EBITDA, the higher chance that you're gonna have some volatile cash flows, right? Um, so I think a million dollars and up. From an employee perspective, we've done, we've done some transactions. I've also worked with some other service professionals that have done transactions where there's, you know, 20 employees, right? But it doesn't have to be these large organizations that have, you know, 500 employees or something like that. Um, I think that when you get to that level, it, it's just, you probably do have a lot more cash flow to make it more economically viable. Um, but it can be a, a pretty small business from that perspective, right? <coughs> um, we recently helped a client with the transaction and it was a $6 million business, right? So, um, you know, they were doing a million to a million five of EBITDA and have some multiples there and that kind of thing. But I think anything lower than that, you're probably going to run into just cash flow concerns. So, yeah. Real quick, if you found that uh, with you know, companies such as contractors or something that require third party unsecured credit, that the shareholders typically have to kind of participate and loan money back in and provide some soft equity? Um, potentially, yeah. I think it all depends on the facts and circumstances with the, the overall transaction, right? So how much is being sold? What's the valuation multiple that we're looking at? What are the you know company's cash flows, that kind of thing? Um, but there are situations where that happens, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of situations where there's some seller carry back debt. And so, you know, those exiting owners haven't really exited yet, right? They're still invested in the future success of the business because I have this bogey out there of getting that whatever, 10, 20, 30% of the value that I, I still haven't have yet to receive. So there are some situations that, that happens for sure. And obviously the contracting industry is unique. You have bonding requirements, right. debt covenants, those types of things. So um, I think ESOPs are great for contractors because it's hard to, you know, most third party professionals don't necessarily want to buy a contract business. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to just be aware of all of those requirements from that perspective. So awesome. So I'd love to give to our panelists um, just a quick introduction that Frank mentioned earlier, but we have Chris Malham, uh, President and CEO of SiteWorks, and then we have Danielle Fuente <coughs> and Dan Fuente, uh, CFO and CEO of BP Electric. So thank you guys for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, So I would like to start with uh, just kind of a, an initial question, kind of a kickoff question, if you will. And Chris, maybe we'll start with you and then turn it over to Dan and Danielle. Um, put you on the spot first. So, uh, but just, you know, give us or share with the, the audience here today, you know, what were the driving factors behind selecting the ESOP, right? Why was that the choice as opposed to third-party transaction, as opposed to, um, you know, selling to key people, uh, selling other business partners, whatever it might be. Uh, last night I sent my son a text. He works at Pepper. He sent me back an acronym, <clears throat> a lot of the LOL kind of deal, and it was TLDR. Anybody know that? Too long, didn't read. If I ever sent that to my old man, <laughs> so my point is, I won't when I'm too long. In here, stop. I'll just meet you. Please. We weren't even for sale. Our company was not for sale. You may or may not know Sideworks. We've been blessed. We've been around for 18 years. The company was absolutely not for sale. We're operators. My business partner and I were strictly operators. Felt that we did a fairly good job. And we built a lot of the sports parks here in town, horizontal, the fields, the site development, so forth. 
And honestly, we didn't have a broker or had an interest in selling because we were not a big uh, recurring revenue company. So we knew the, the multiple on a straight construction company wasn't going to be that high. So I had two sons in the business. My business partner, Rob, had none, but we thought, we'll just hang on to it and let it run. Got some cute people that have been with us since we started in my little shit two-bedroom apartment in Arizona Avenue in Germain and <laughs> hold on to the business and let it, let it uh, kind of grow. But we finished Sun Devil Stadium. We did the work for Hunt Construction at Sun Devil Stadium, three-phase construction. And it was kind of cool, y'all. We got uh, a lot of recognition on that because a lot of the big boys in the country came in to submit on that project. I mean, big, big guys. They, they spend more in posting notes than we did in volume. And uh, at the time, our company was about $35 million a year business. And we were awarded the project and we were fortunate. It went extremely well. Challenges, sequential, three phase deal, time sensitive. Michael Crow was in it. Hunt was heavy duty. It was just plans were a challenge. Anyway, when we finished it, there was a lot of recognition to all the companies that were on that project. And uh, I can't say just us. We did a pretty good job, but so did everybody else out there. It was a challenge to schedule and so forth. I bring that up because from there, the industry took notice of our company and um, we started getting calls of, hey, are you interested? So in our business, and this is too long because I'm going to get the answer. You're either a landscape contractor, <laughs> you're either a landscape contractor, do things like infrastructure. We did Dorado, DC Ranch, and those kinds of projects. No front yards. That was never all, all site development. Or you're either a sport field builder. And there's great guys that do both. And when we decided to... Uh, well, three guys that do individual. When we said we melt the two together, the industry, not the industry, they're going to screw that thing up. They're going to they're going to water down two the roles that they're very good at. And I'm telling you, without sounding sappy, by the grace of God, and hard work, we were really fortunate to hold a good presence in both realms. And from that, Wall Street or whoever we want to say, private equity took note and started blowing up our phone, my phone specifically, not Rob. Rob's kind of, Rob's awesome, best business partner I can ever have, but he's an operator. And I was, we always say, Mel him with uh, catch him and score with gutter. And that's kind of how the team works. And I started with a lot of calls. And we, uh, one of the biggest uh, in interests were uh, a contractor out of uh, Pittsburgh. And I said, we're not for sale. Anyway, they came in, we started talking, and then they started throwing crazy numbers at us like, I remember saying, there's no way our company is worth that much money. I mean, honestly, and it wasn't reverse psychology. There's just no way. And they said, well, you got the footprint, blah, blah, blah. We learned about it. We advanced on it. We kept it quiet. We were meeting them at Durant's downtown, visiting with them, and they were talking about our org chart. And we were moving in the direction of selling this company at, at, a, at a really, really enormous number, at least for us it was. But you guys... Else, but they were talking in front of us, looking at our org chart, and they were saying, I remember sharing this with you earlier. Yeah. Well, this role we won't need, and this is redundant. We can pull this out of our Albuquerque office. And, and you know, it's like when you sell your house, you can't get pissed if they're going to paint it because it's not your house. <laughs> so, <laughs> basic, right? So, when we are listening, and Rob and I were in the half booth at Durant's, we've all been to Durant's, guys on the end, Rob, I'm there, then and Rob and I are like, what the hell is you know, they're going to dismantle what we felt was a strong team. Many had been with us since we started out of the, the apartment. Two weeks after we started, Rafael Martinez had a leave because his wife had a baby. Today, Rafael Jr. is one of our foremen on the uh, Desert Diamond Casino project. I mean, it's just, that sounds silly, but I mean, that's just the duration of this company. So we thought, well, that's sound the company. If they're going to dismantle what we had, Rob and I had a great lifestyle. We worked our tail off, so we did a little fact finding. Don't went to MK's point. Don't Google ESOP. It'll scare you. Don't do it. It's too much. It's too much. So through Mike Olson and our 401k contact, Mike, am I right? Uh, we learned about WealthPoint, and then we decided to interview three other companies. And what we learned is that punchline again. We can have a succession plan. And everybody can keep their desk or their truck or their dinner. And that's what it was. And I can get into choosing welcome, but it was honestly, we wanted to 
financially reward, there's 248 people, I don't think they wrote the book, 248 people, financially reward the non-owners of our company that gave us the very financial and emotional value that we have. And I know that's not registered with a lot of people, but and we actually took less we had a hard offer that was actually higher than the stock, but it was the same. Well, I, I think if I can add to that, I think it was higher because they were going to cut a lot of your workforce, so that's how they were going to pay for it, right? So, yeah. um, sorry, that was a long run, but that's I'm telling you, that's exactly how it went down. We took bets, Chris. That was actually less than I was anticipating. <laughs> 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 well, I really don't know. Just say if you hear yourself talk about it. So, uh, same question for, for you, Dan, and, and Danielle. Uh, maybe Dan, more focused for you since, since you were the owner. Um, so currently the owner, but uh, yes. yeah, maybe add some, some color on that. Sure. <clears throat> Um, I hope you guys don't have lunch plans because it's very similar to <laughs> 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 um, Basically, some similarities as far as, you know, a, a company that is focused on its people. And um, I started DP Electric 32 years ago out of my garage. Uh, we slowly had grew uh, throughout the years. And now uh, I, I believe we're in the top three in the Valley. We do 100 million in revenue have 500 employees and um, we have generated a culture within our company that is very family oriented <clears throat> even though we are um, a, a large I guess medium to large size company and um, for me uh, why we went in ESOP was is because I heard a lot of the horror stories about when you sell to a third party how they come in and they typically will give you half and then you have to stay on for a certain period of time, but you don't have control anymore. And generally they don't work. And then at, to similar to, to this gentleman, I had private equity blowing up my phone like crazy. And I entertained some of those conversations, but for me, it was the kind of thing, they were more investors and they wanted to pour a bunch of money in, give me some money and then restructure and, <coughs> And really look at like a stock, right? They wanted that value to go up and then they were going to turn around and sell it again, monetize it again and keep doing that, right? Which I didn't want. And so for the last, um, I would say the last 15 years or so, I've been thinking about secession. As you get older, you start thinking about those things, right? And, and um, my CPA at the time, um, I was talking to him about doing an ESOP. And he had said to me, you're not big enough, nor are you structured enough to be an ESOP. And I, I completely disagreed with them. I took offense to it. And then I started to kind of think it through and I said, Shit, he's right. So I focused on creating a team and I was looking for people that could run the business without me. And I was trying to set up the business to run without me. And so, I got very fortunate that my daughter came on board six years ago. Just six, seven, seven. Oops. <laughs> seven years ago. Uh, the first two years she wasn't sure, and then the third year, there's no way I was going to her out of there. And she's earned the respect of everybody within the company. She is my succession. We've already got it mapped out when she's going to take the CEO role. Um, and then at the same time, I wrapped around a leadership group around her. And that's how we went. And, and so what we did is, is I said, okay, you guys run the company, I'm not in the day to day anymore. I'm here to coach and mentor. And I gave them a percentage of the profits and they did that very successfully for a few years. And then I told them that they had potential at ownership. And so at that time, when I felt like taking the advice of my CPA, that the company was running without me, um, I thought it was time to do an ESOP. And so, so the reason that we did the ESOP is that because of our people, similar to, to this gentleman, I, I could not see somebody that worked for me for 20 years or 15 years or 10 years. Uh, the reason that they're at DP is because they see something in us, they like the company, they respect what we're doing, and I did not want their lives to be disrupted. And our culture is very unique in that sense. And I thought we already function like an ESOP to some degree. 
because we're all pulling weight together and everybody on our team is, is, is very impactful. Um, so it just was a natural fit. And I think for, for Danielle, um, you know, I'll let her talk, talk about that a little bit. I, she was trying to decide, do we, do we do ESOP, not do ESOP? Obviously she could be the, the, you know, the owner, um, like, like I am. But what I had said to her was, is it's very difficult to monetize a company. So it's like, you know, she's already going to be the benefic beneficiary of whatever I have when I pass. And it's like, you don't want to be in a situation where say 20 years or 25 years from now, you're trying to do what I'm doing now. Right. It's like, let's, let's put it in place. Let, let's have you be the benefit of what's going on. And then you create this and then you can decide what to do with it later. Because although ESOPs, uh, I heard you can sell ESOPs, right, Michael? You can. Yeah. So it gives you options, right? And, and so we monetized 30%. Um, did a bank loan. Um, I wanted to do a bank loan because I wanted the leadership team to have uh, something they had to work towards, you know, to, to pay off. Uh, we didn't need the bank loan, but we did the bank loan. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. It's, it's something that I always wanted to do. And at the time, um, knowing a lot of people in the industry, anytime that we were talking about secession, I was always talking to, no offense to people that sell insurance in the room, but I was always talking to insurance people and all these other types of people. And it was, I felt like they were trying to sell me something versus trying to help me. And I was looking for a quarterback. And so we were fortunate to be introduced to WellPoint and that's how they operated and they've been a great partner. Um, so yeah, perfect. Danielle, any comments or thoughts from you? I just agree with Dan. I feel like it's just part of our culture. And I think um, as his successor, I wanted that ability to still guide the ship and make sure that the business was going in the right direction. And I feel like I still have that with the ESOP. Um, but I think just sharing and the success of the company was just something that is a really cool concept for both of us. So I was happy to be a part of it. Awesome. Uh, so next question, and Daniel, I'm going to start with you on this one, uh, because otherwise I don't know how many times you'll actually get a chance to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing that I, I took away from, from everything that was just said was impact, right? The team, the culture, um, you know, those types of things. What has been the impact of the ESOP, either on you personally, on the business, um, the employees, just, you know, and, and for everybody here, these are actually very recent ESOPs. Um, uh, Sideworks was just became an ESOP uh, nine months ago. August 30th. Yeah, August thirty first, and then uh, DP Electric was March, February, March of, of last year. Um, Danielle actually mentioned to me before we started that uh, it feels like it's been a very long time, and I took that as a compliment <laughs> because it was a great strategy. Um, but uh, just curious, of what's what's been the impact overall? Yeah. Um... So when we announced it in February of last year, we did like, um, we sent out a YouTube video with Dan speaking um, and it generated that excitement. We went out to job sites. I think it's hard for employees to really conceptualize what it is until they get their first statement. So we actually got those this week and we're gonna pass them out at job sites tomorrow. So I'm really excited about that because it actually is like the value that they're getting in retirement. And for us, for our first statement, I was a little unsure about what that value would be, given that usually the share price goes down after the debt is added to the business. Um, but it ended up being about 2% of base compensation for the first year, and that's just going to grow as more shares are allocated and the share price goes up. So I feel like it was a decent chunk of money for our first year. Um, we just, every quarterly meeting we do, every time um, we do team meetings, we just try to reiterate it. And so I do feel like it's starting to create that buzz, um, but I think it also takes time because we did that big announcement in the spring and then now it's been a year and we do our best to keep it top of mind. But I think the statements every year are gonna be the biggest impact where it starts to feel like more real. Yeah. Um, before Dan and Chris talk, just a quick question. You talked about you know, 
2% of compensation, um, which depending on how you're looking at it, seems like a great thing, or it seems like, uh, I wish it was more, right? Mm -hmm. But how much growth has DP had over the last year? Employee size or number of employees, those types of things. I think it's been pretty substantial. Right, so our employee base, um, we're at about 450 people. When we did the ESOP, we were closer to 300. Um, so we've seen a lot of employee growth. Our top line grew. Um, 2021 was a little tough with material escalation and some of those things, but our share value of just the organization still grew year over year by about 3%. Um, and so also part of the ESOP is we structured it where you have to wait a year to be in the ESOP, and then it's also vested over a six year period. So it's really meant to reward the people that stay. It's that long-term benefit. Um, so for all the new people we onboarded, they'll get a statement the following year, yeah. but I think it's good for them to see their peers opening up their statements when we go out tomorrow and get excited about being a part of it. So, awesome. Did that answer your question? It does, yeah, okay. that's great, absolutely. Dan, how about you? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, well, that's, right. <laughs> that's what happens when you're 50. <laughs> uh, just the, the impact, right? So you, know, you talked about the reasons for the ESOP was to keep yeah. the team, okay. right? Yeah. Now that you've done it, yeah. what has been that impact on the team? Or you know, I think to Danielle's point, it, it's <coughs> difficult for for our guys to to really perceive that because you know, in the construction workforce, unfortunately, a lot of them are just kind of paycheck to paycheck, and you know, they don't really have that that vision of retirement. In fact, we have to force a lot of, not force, but encourage a lot of people to get involved in our 401k and things like that. Um, so I, I think, you know, the branding's helped. We, we have a slogan that says we own it. Um, we've had shirts come out where we had the logo on there. Uh, we've done a lot of branding, like Danielle says, it's top of mind. We talk about it all the time. And I think eventually, when they get their their statements, and then I think even more so next year when they get their statement, then it's then I think that excitement's going to come because now they have a baseline, right? And they don't know if that's good or bad, what have you. And and uh, you know a year from now, hopefully that's four percent, you know, and that just continues to grow. And we're hoping that when they're fully vested, that maybe it's twelve percent or something like that, right? So it's it's uh, I think that it. Because of our culture, it's not like people are going to leave us because that number is low. They're already they're already part of the team. They have no intentions of leaving. So this is just added value for them. But I think a lot of that excitement will probably start to come. Awesome. Right. And when we were, and when we explained it to our team, we said this is an additional benefit that you guys get, and there's no cost to you. Right. 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 So it's just on top of everything else we're doing with benefits we're not planning on taking anything away to make this happen and so it's really just something that they now have as a retirement benefit that didn't exist a year ago so. yeah and I, i'd like to add to that that it was very important to us not to take anything away because you know we've heard stories of where people form an ESOP and then they reduce the benefits they reduce the bonuses because we got to pay off yeah, right. And you're going to get your money eventually, but right now we got to bump it down. And so year after year, <clears throat> we give anywhere between a three to five percent cash bonus at the end of the year. We would give three percent to the 401k. Um, all our benefits are, 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 are great. We do bonus structures and all this stuff. It was very important to me and to the team that we did not dilute what we had now and that this was just added value. And if we couldn't do that, we weren't going to do it. Right? Chris, how about for you? Sightworks. You know, we really, the company didn't grow all that much because the year prior to the stop, so our stop was 20, so 19 to 20, we grew almost 30%. So we really, by design, slowed the machine down. It's too much. And then to Danielle's point, yeah. to Danielle's point on the supply chain issue, we're going to get in that really crimped a lot of things that we're doing. So we absolutely maximize that profitability. And I will tell you, I think, there's no reverse psychology to it. The team did not 
work any harder. They always worked harder. We didn't ask them to work harder. But they knew Rob and I were eventually uh, going to sell and move on or have a succession. So I'm good then. And I'm 62, soon to be 63. And I thought, you know, it would be neat to do something. My boys are not the heir apparent. They got to prove themselves to the guys that, I mean, there were seven when I started the company. So they got to prove themselves to the guys that were with me in the apartment, right? So we knew they weren't the, uh, this, uh, the heir apparent, but it was really kind of cool. I didn't meet any of the WealthCoin guys for months because it was in the height of COVID. And so it really wasn't until we went hard on the deal that we all really knew what we kind of looked like and how tall we were and all that stuff. <laughs> and, um, it, was, it was cool. And then um, we wanted WealthPoint to be at our rollout, which happened in November. And it was so funny. We had this thing under wraps and we knew the team would dig it. So we started in January, January 8th, and we went hard on the deal August 31st. And we were all really excited. And then, okay, September 1, let's get it. Get everybody in and, and their thinking was brilliant and i really mean that they said people are going to freak out on isan we all you know you got to google it to know the acronym i knew the acronym. i heard the acronym i really couldn't tell you what it meant until we started moving in that direction and uh, they said no 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 we want to become an isan then we want to roll it out a couple months later so you're not just saying, hey, today we are an ESOP. We want to say we're an ESOP. And oh, by the way, we've been an ESOP for two and a half months. And has anything changed in your life? And that was really, I thought, a brilliant strategy. Because the first thing they're going to do is they're going to Google it. Or what does it cost? And, what, and we completely, where's Frank? Frank's right there. Frank really, and MK, of course. Guys, so knowledgeable. If you're going to advance on an ESOP, just make sure you talk to these guys. They got it down. But they really orchestrated a compatible rollout to take the guesswork out of it. We're heavy, heavy Hispanic, 190 Hispanics, of course, been with me forever, love them to death, just sensational coworkers, all coworkers, no, no employees. And they knew Rob and I were gonna move on. And when we did the rollout, you were there, right? And Frank were there. We had everybody, and so, we did a uh, wild horse pass. So we always have our venue there. I'm gonna get things up for a second. So we had a, 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 a fall function, like around Thanksgiving, but not a Christmas deal. So for us to gather for that was not anything out of the norm, like what the hell's going on? Why are you sidewalk shattered? So we thought this would be a great time. So remember, we went hard August 31st, so September, October, now end of November, three months. And we got everybody together and uh, MK was there and Frank was with me. and. They all roll their eyes. Oh, Chris is going to give another speech about the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, we said, well, oh, and by the way, we've decided to sell the company. And I've had people older than me to go with me. And, you know, just a lot of people. Very, We're in a highly transient business. I mean, my presuming are too. And to have that kind of uh, labor force stay with you, They'll leave you for a quarter. I mean, but they just did. Yeah, I mean, perfect. Nope. They're really compatible. So we said we finally found uh, the right buyer for this company. It deserves more than anybody. And it's you. And I swear they turned around and took somebody behind. <laughs> <laughs> 200 something. No, you. And I'm telling you, they didn't ball that they got many 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 got weepy and then okay and it's very it's like when i get with my mechanic just don't you know i'll go into the car which is i really don't know what the hell you're talking about he brought it to a level that they knew everything about it without having to google it what it meant it didn't cost anything he didn't have to get mawkish on what we did we chose to do that we didn't want to make it about us it had nothing to do about rob and i it was the right thing to do. That's really what our message was. I mean, I've had the company for 18 years. I honestly, not that I've arrived, but Rob and I have done very well. We've worked our ass off with them very, very well. And we did very well because of 248 people out there that allowed us to do that. And it was really that give back. So did anything change? No, people just started busting their ass and <coughs> time and time again coming into my office. 
thank you for not selling them and how exciting. And then I even brought one because I want to give it to Frank. Decals on the back of our trucks. And we, nothing against the 30%. We were looking at doing a 40, 60. But when we were halfway through, we said, the hell with it. We want to demonstrate to our team, it's all or nothing. We're going for it. I don't need to realize something on the next day. I wanted to demonstrate, as did Rob. Rob and I are very unique. I mean, I listen to Neil Sedak and he listens to Megatech. I mean, I just were but when it came to running that company, we're closer to two coats of paint. And when we said no, we're gonna go 100 percent ESOP, it was you got it, let's make it happen. And that's that was really the ties of mine. And you work with both of us. I mean, pretty opposite guys. But no, I said, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's short for his weight, and I try and you know. <laughs> <laughs> but when we did it, it made all the difference in the world. And we wanted to demonstrate to our team kind of all or nothing. So when we got these decals on our trucks, I know, I'm part of um, they were all the guys were fighting for. We want a decal. When are we getting our truck decal? Because they were so proud to display 100% employee owned company. So the backlog today. And it hit yesterday is at 60 million, still not the size of your company. You got an awesome plan there going. But the company is just tremendously paid out. And I will tell you, our customer base, and a lot of them sport field people or construction, love the fact that we're at ESOP because of the, the value that the people that are actually on the job sites have to the commitment of the projects. And that honestly, more than anything else, has been very, very noticeable. We just picked up the maintenance contract for Marina Heights, probably the finest office park right there at the end of uh, the State Park building. And one of the things that Transwestern said, hey, Transwestern said, I think it's cool as shit, that's all they said, that you're an ESOP. Because now there's a commitment, not just from you, Chris, but from the very people that are gonna be working on our project. And that was the first time I heard it. Awesome. That was cool. That's great. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so just a couple more questions. I had a long list, but we're Sorry. going to start to uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, um, I just want to be mindful of everybody's yeah. time. Uh, maybe talk a little bit, uh, Dan, we'll start with you. Was there anything surprising, uh, either positively or negatively, about the process, right? Going through the process. Um, you know. Yeah, you know, I would say it, you hear all the stories, and, and I'm not doing the, the finance side of it, the paperwork side of it, so I'm sure Dan Hills had a different story, but uh, I felt it to be very simple. Um, it, it's just a basic, very simple concept. You know, you have a value, um, and whatever that value you're going to monetize, and you know, it, like, like Mike says, you got you got appraised and I think the one thing that was a little weird for me and I really really did not like it kind of took offense to it was the the trustee that whole process of Frank Frank helped navigate that for us but we were I was just like because because they, they look at it as like they don't know you and they're looking at you like you're trying to game the system or whatever and they have have rules and and, and responsibilities that they have to follow and so it was just strange that whole concept. They were the they were the representing the buyer, if you will, and they were doing their due diligence. And I kind of took some things personal, like, you know, we're not that kind of people or we don't do that, or whatever the case may be. So so there was a little tension during that process. Um, they did a valuation that I did not get to see that I paid for, which I felt like, okay, that's BS. <laughs> but that was but that was the only piece and i understand why we couldn't see the valuation because they it was arm's length and you know the thing with esop it's a, it really is a government program right and so there's a lot of oversight on it um and i know that danielle's been doing a lot of financial paperwork and a lot of different things and we did develop our board uh, but i think I think I would say 80% positive and maybe 20% negative. And that negative was a very short period of time. And it wasn't WellPoint, it was a third party. And um, yeah, so I, I think for the most part, it's been, it's been good. Um, I know that it's uh, a lot of work. I see her doing a lot of things re related to it. So 
you got to be prepared for that. But I think once we're in our first year, and I think once we get through that first year, maybe it'll get easier and easier as we go. But I think the value of, of, of not paying taxes, I mean, we, prior to the last administration, we were paying 38%, and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna get back there if not higher here, uh, years to come, depending on what happens. Um, so when you can, so the thought process of taking that 38% of cash and being able to use it, right? And we did 30%, I, I think the only thing that I go back and forth on is, should we have done 100%? Um, because to, to, to his point, it's, I think it would be awesome to put that 100%, but I'm also a very conservative person, and the owner still has skin in the game. Until, until it's completely, that debt's paid off, uh, I'm holding that bag. And so I did not want to take too big of a bite, and that's why I decided to take a small bite. There are advantages to that, because when I do the next bite, that'll praise higher, so I'll get more money uh, versus... But that's not why I'm in it. I'm, I'm really in it to, to create secession and, and turn it over to the next group of folks. And it's not about money for me. I already got money, so I'm good. Dave, how are you? How was, you know, good news, bad news? Just kind of feedback on the, the overall process. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's where WealthPoint comes in. I think that they made it easier because they did a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, as far as more work for your financial person, I don't think it's really that cumbersome. It's just like anything where it's a once a year thing. It doesn't impact my life every month. It's more just closing out the year, doing the valuation, understanding that process. Um, there are additional fees every year you're paying, right? Evaluation, TPA, all of that to consider. But as far as like workload, I don't think it's anything crazy. Um, and I would say that overall our business was, even though we're a family business, it was pretty clean. Like our balance sheet was clean. We didn't have a lot of things that an ESOP trustee would have issues with. Um, so we didn't have to really change a lot of our structure. Um, but that is a little bit of a difference and with things related to like the family or those things. That's where you have to make sure you're not crossing a line for doing something that should be approved by a trustee of an ESOP. So that's a little bit of an adjustment, but it didn't impact us too, too badly. So. That's a good thing because I think Pam might have uh, had more issues with the trustee if there was anything else that he needed to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, I will say, you know, when you're doing that and you get it, you they're doing a valuation and you don't know what that number is and they're negotiating. Uh, we know what that number is today because we had our one year valuation. So they showed us what it was back then. And what WealthPoint told us what it was worth or what they felt that number should be was spot on to what their valuation was. So there was no there was no money left on the table. There was no, it was just like, it was almost like, <clears throat> you know what I mean? It was so close. So kudos, kudos to them for, for knowing their business. And, and uh, oh yeah, that was, that was great. Yeah, and I'll just add one thing before Chris, you answer that question. But, um, you know, I think what Dan's alluding to is it is a third party transaction, right? And you go through all of the same steps as you do if you're going to go and sell the business, right? You go through the LOI, you go through legal docs, you go through purchase price negotiations, due diligence, all of that. And it, it can be uncomfortable. I, mean, I, I remember those phone calls of that. I won't repeat them, but there was not a set of clients asking for that information. But you would have gotten those calls if you went to a third yeah. party, right, um, from that perspective. So yeah. you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that ESOPs are a third party transaction. You don't skip any steps, right? Right. Um, but that being said, it's also a much maybe simpler or more defined process as well. So Chris, how about you? It was you know um, surprising. Yeah, to dovetail their comments very similar. And honestly, if I'm lying, I'm not well point did not adulterate our thinking on saying anything to promote them, I swear. Or did they reduce their fees or anything? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I almost think we should be getting paid. <laughs> but I will tell you, so here's what we can do. I'll, I'll, I'll like this out for three minutes, I promise you. We, once we learned about ESOP, understood all the mechanics of it, we said we're going to find three firms 
uh, to talk to. The first one was out of Columbus, Ohio, and probably the most now extremely knowledgeable, but the guy would not shut up, and it was Zoom. And I remember telling my partners, we'll never be able to fire the guy because he won't shut up <laughs> long enough to know that he's fired. <laughs> so <laughs> then I introduced this. So that was the, the, the he's probably the biggest one in Columbus. So if anybody's talking about it, very knowledgeable, just be careful. But then um, we learned about Wellpoint. They were number two. And MK was on the this is this is really key to the answer. You were on the call. I don't know if Frank was on the Yeah, I was on it. Me and Tim both. Okay. Um, and maybe it's just because the first guy was so bad. They listened, <laughs> they were transparent. They and I say dummy it down, it can be really complicated and brought it down to a level that we were able to understand it, listen to it. They said, one of the guys said, and by the way, we're going to spend an inordinate amount of time interviewing your key people because we may come to the realization that you're not a candidate for an ESA. And if you're kind of thin skinned or it's overly protective of your company, you would take umbrage to that. But we said, awesome. Find out. Love to know what our coworkers think of us and the leadership that we have. And <clears throat> I guess the punchline is they were so transparent on everything the cheers and the tears of the process, everything on their fees. On their, their response, I felt like at times we were their only customer because of their responsiveness. Frank and I had many after hours, nine thirty at night calls, not doubt or questioning, but just that's what it took to move it. And we started when we knocked ours out eight eight months, perhaps. Yeah, yeah something. Like that. And they said, start off slow, but those last two months we're going to be swimming three, four times a week, and we were prepared, so all that guesswork was was taken out. So I will tell you, if it wasn't the and maybe we weren't an omelet, and, and maybe. You, you, it's, it's, it has a different take. But if it wasn't for the personality of Wellpoint, I don't think we would have done it. So, no way. No way. Because you're open your kimono. You just got, I mean, there's just too many levers being pulled too fast. And I wasn't the financial guy at all. So we had Angel in our pocket with MK. And then uh, we had a real, real strong office manager who really took a CFO role. So I was kind of more the emotional kind of connection on the whole thing. And honestly, because of the way you guys handled it, even the tough stuff, we had some tough moments, but it was never trust, doubt, frustration, and stuff. Uh, uh, we love, are you using Steve James? We, we see your trustee. We love, we call it hell out of him. He's a dude, you don't have to call him that. Just because he's got CFO experience. So we tap him for everything. <laughs> <laughs> because he love what he knows, man. He's, he knows a lot. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. But hey, Steve, he doesn't want it. He doesn't need to know that we're buying new trucks over at Earnhardt. It, this, this is our thought. This is how we finance it. He's just been awesome. But it was because of the way um, Wellpoint was user friendly. I, I don't know how to say it. It's not as potent, but it was completely that. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Not to interrupt you. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I just want to say that it, it's like I said before, it's important that you have structure because I think a lot of the ESOPs that fell don't have that, right? And one of the, I, I kind of feel like we're up here advertising the well, point, but one of the things that was, was most important through that process that WellPoint did do is look at our team and have individual conversations with every one of our leadership team and vet that process to make sure that it was going to be successful. You know what I mean? To, to his point, it was like, and I felt that that was very important because I did not want to, you know, it's a family business and, and I value my, my, my people and, and I didn't want to just kind of run through this and have some guy say, oh yeah, this is what you do, sign here, you know, and we're done, right? So they really took their time to to vet it and to meet with our people and to help us with structure too. If they introduce us to traction, um, we, we have a coach through them. I mean, the things that not along with just the ESOP, but with everything else tied together and the ESOP, it just really has helped us kind of get to that, to those next few steps in our team and just the, the trust that they have and just, that open dialogue, it's its really been impactful. And I think that that's incredibly important to an ESOP. Although it's a financial transition, it really is an emotional transition as well. 
So I know we're right up, right up on uh, about out of time. Um, but I just want to end it maybe with one question. I may have to time everybody's responses to it. But um, Chris, we'll start with you. You know, we have a few business owners that are here today, some online, and if they're not business owners, everybody in here has or an advisor in some capacity with has lots and lots of business owner clients. So what advice would you give to a business owner if they're considering doing any stuff? Yeah. Understand uh, and make your third like you know, third part. I'm not an entrepreneur, just the only business I've ever owned, so I don't need like a kin shoes or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so be prepared because it's a, it's a full, full on disclosure and it's deep and it's time, time consuming. So that's presumably a third party sale is. But we happen to, and yeah, I guess it, it seems like we're promoting all, but they never said one thing about it and answered as truthfully. But because of well points of compatibility, it went faster than we thought and easier than we ever would have imagined. And not one bit of yes or doubt. So, and do do is perhaps like we did, interview a couple, but we just happen to be equally yoked with, with the well point guys. And not because it's the, the, the guys club, because several ladies in our organization were absolutely involved and they would hang up the calls and think, God dang, those guys are easy to work with. And it was tough, it was really tough. So, Bet it out and you know, give them the benefit of the doubt because they're on uncharted waters too. And I dug that they interviewed our key people that I have no idea what was talked about. They did none of the outcomes or what I didn't want to know. And they came back and said, you really got proven out. And what Rob and I did early on, I'll be real quick, was we stuck, not that I, I touched the business. I hate that bullshit. I run my business at 4,000 feet. Unless you're a pilot, you run the business or you don't. <laughs> and we ran our business, but we weren't control freaks at all. Zero zip, nil, nothing. And I didn't have squatters rights on anything. I, I took president off my card. I love being introducing a team that we led it. So we were kind of in a boot camp for an ESOP long before we ever fought because we were, you know, giving people opportunities to advance. So one of the things, I mean, it was Tim who said, you obviously had done some training with your people because there's no like succession can they carry it on. They were already carrying it on. But I'm in, I go in every day. I still, I'm hauling ass there right after this. I might be playing Frogger at my desk, but <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> I'm there every single day, but not anybody shit wants to be in a bar so because it's really a fun environment to work in. Awesome. Uh, Danielle, how about you? Uh, I mean, I just think when it comes to succession and exit strategy, I would just say it's never too soon to start thinking about that. And I feel like it's a testament to Dan that 15 years ago, he was had that in his brain and put a lot of work to make it happen. Um, and then I think just having the right advisors. I'm somebody, maybe being a financial person, want to see all those options, pros and cons of every path you can take. And we actually started with WellPoint a year and a half before we even landed on the ESOP because we had to go through that process. Um, so just know all your options and surround yourself <coughs> with um, people that know, know the business. So, awesome. yeah. Great point. And last but not least, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that uh, culture and just how your business function is, is very important. I, I think that um, you, you have, I, I think in order for an ESOP to be successful, the culture has to match the vehicle, right? And so I think, I think it's important, you know, it's one thing to monetize your company and, and you know, get some chips off the table, but make sure that you do your due diligence and that you do it correctly, that you're doing it for the right reasons. And I do think an ESOP is a fantastic model. I've heard stories of other general contractors that are 100% ESOP and they have guys that have worked for them for 25 years and they got $10 million in their, their ESOP and it's a, it's a shop guy in the, in the back warehouse, right? So it really is a vehicle that, you know, it's, it's fair for everyone. It's a vehicle that also I think actually helps move the company in the sense that at some point, you end up with a lot of extra cash because you're not giving it to Uncle Sam. So once the debt's paid off and you're not paying Uncle Sam 38%, you keep that money in your organization 
and I know competitors that are 100% ESOP, and they use that money to grow their business, and they're buying other companies in other states, and they're doing. So I'm excited about the future as far as when we get to that point um, and having that additional uh, cash. Uh, and that, that additional cash just goes to your valuation so that your value goes up as well. So it really is a very, very great concept. I think it's probably one of the good things that our government has done. I'd say one of the only <laughs> Uh, so yeah anyway I, I just say just be mindful and make sure it's it's the right thing for you and your in your business you know and Kate, i would say anybody in here that may not want to ask a question in an open form like this i really got a lot of time on my hands these days <laughs> four year employment treatment <laughs> so well running that if i touched it i'm afraid that that might happen but if they have, sure. I welcome anybody to call and I guarantee my answer in a one on one private confidential conversation would be exactly what I said here. But if you have questions or issues or cheers or on any, I would welcome anybody. To call. I'd love to help you, not just to promote WellPoint, but to help anybody. Because I will say my epilogue is after we learned about it, it was either an ESOP or never sell the company. It was never an option to go out, not with the team. That we have. So if anybody wanted to further that on conversation or to chat afterwards, I'd be happy, at least from our perspective. Sure. Great. I oh, appreciate that, of course. So I know we're a little bit over on time, but uh, I just want to first say thank you. Thank you all three of you for coming on behalf of myself, the Wealth Point team, everybody here. I think this was fantastic. Appreciate the insight, the perspective. Um, you know, you guys are fantastic people and uh, wish you all the best going forward. So.